All right, welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris, and today I'm joined with Ron Evans from the Cincinnati Zoo, who is the uh, curator of primates. Hey, Ron. Hey, how you doing, Chris? Doing awesome. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us. You know, I've just been so excited for this interview. It's what we like to do, you know. Anytime we get a chance to share our conservation stories, um, it makes us happy. Yes, yes, and we love love what you do, and we're glad we can help. First thing I always like to ask my my guests is if you can just kind of just give a, a brief background, you know, where you grew up, how you got involved with conservation <laughs> and ended up at the Cincinnati Zoo. Well, that's a long story. How long do you have, Chris? Now we have all the time <laughs> in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a Cincinnati native born and raised, and uh, Thane Maynard introduces me to people. He's the director here at the Cincinnati Zoo. This is Ron Evans. He's curator of primates. His parents left him here one day and never came back. So that's <laughs> that's kind of my history. But, you know, it goes back further than that. You know, I grew up with parents who loved the outdoors for the most part. They used to take us camping when we were little kids. And that young exposure is, I think, what really did it for me. We had woods near our house, and we would spend all summer out in the, out in the woods building clubhouses and rope swings. So I've always had a love of nature and that's what's so important about you know young folks getting out there and getting connected to nature at a young age it's getting there's more and more of a gap between us and the natural world um but that was that that was my start and it always had my animals always had my interest in nature so as a kid i had a million different pets i had the opportunity once again to start around the zoo at a, at a, at a as a teenager and i I always like tropical fish. I always imagine myself working in our aquarium we used to have. And then I had the opportunity to help one of the gorilla keepers out one Saturday. And I said, sure, I've never seen a gorilla before up close. And went in there and took one look at a gorilla. And it's like one of those moments people have in their lives. I don't know if everybody has these moments, but I had one where you just kind of knew what you were going to do the rest of your life. One look at a gorilla. And I was like, oh, I, I knew I was going to be sitting here talking with you on this interview <laughs> 35 <laughs> years later, you know. That's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, you know, and I just worked my way up through the zoo over the years. I, they hired me actually when I was 17 years old as a zookeeper, and that was a different time back in the early 80s. But, um, you know, we don't do that these days. The pathway to becoming a zookeeper in the zoo business or a manager is definitely uh, long and a lot of competition. A lot of people want to be involved with, with wild animals like we have in zoos, and that's great. But, you know, you get your degree, you have to intern, you have to be better than every other intern, you have to vol- volunteer, get into it part-time rank, and then be better than everybody else that's doing that is, at the same time, and then kind of be in the right place at the right time after you do all those prerequisites. It's really tricky. And that's a good thing because it allows us to be really, really picky about who we bring in to do the important work of taking care of these animals and telling their stories. No, it is. It's so interesting because it seems like all the people we interview, there's just a similar theme. And, you know, you opened up with being out in nature and having animals, having pets, Right. So that has such an impact on you as a young kid. Absolutely. Yeah, it does. Um, and that, that once again, that's just just the way of our, our, our lives are these days. You know, it's so tied to our computers and our phones. And that's for better or worse. You know, it, it, it helps us do things better. It helps us enjoy life better. But it just kind of dr- makes a wedge between the average person and the natural world more and more often, which is a real challenge for conservation messaging and you know and we got we don't want to go too sensational with our messaging because we want people to truly understand what we're talking about when we talk about conservation and that's why zoos are so important to that you know um, they are that opportunity for the average person in the middle of a city who usually has you know plenty of time on their phone or on their computer it, it gives them that moment where they can go to the zoo and actually see a gorilla or see a bonobo, or see an eye eye, or a pygmy slow loris, or a whatever it is that you want to take a look at, and have maybe have one of those moments like I had when I was a teen, young teenager, to maybe like, wow, 
that that's something special and maybe I should pay attention a little bit closer. And it gives us the opportunity, of course, to share those stories. No, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I go back to my childhood and San Diego Zoo, you know, that is where my love and appreciation for all species developed. And eventually I went on, got my you know, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD. And here I am today, you know, speaking to people all over the world about animal conservation. So I, I, I just want to, the, the take home message for the listeners is, you know, get your children involved, go visit your accredited zoos, aquariums, and get out into nature as much as you can or parks or things like that. that, that that's kind of <laughs> wrap that up. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm really glad you said accredited zoo because that's very mm -hmm. important. There are a lot mm -hmm. of people who think they are doing good for animals or maybe actually not doing so good for animals that may call themselves a zoo. But when you're talking about an AZA, Association of Zoos and Aquariums Accredited Zoo, you're talking about an organization that has to meet incredibly high standards to get that accreditation. And it means that the animals in that facility are getting exemplary care and are doing all kinds of things that require you to be able to get that accreditation. So stick with those, not not Joe's Roadside Menagerie. That's probably not helping much when you when you go to those things. No, but there's no, some good it, there's some good supporting zoos out there as well. There is, there is, and, and Angie and I, you know, I mean, you know, we're not paid by zoos. We're not, you know, even supported by zoos. We support you guys and what you do, and really it's we understand accreditation and we understand the the strict guidelines and we understand you know animal physiology stress behavior nutrition all that stuff so so that's why we always try to make sure that we say go to the you know the cincinnati zoos of the world and speaking of that though it's like i i guess you know it, your interest in conservation began when you were young but if you could kind of tell the listeners who you know, you've been in the zoo industry for, for quite a while and these animals under human care, how has that changed? And, and even in the eighties, you were working in conservation. It's just now that's, it's just so important right now, right? It's so critical with what's going on. Absolutely. You know, zoos have come a long way in, in, in my career, that's for sure. And I still have a lot of career to go and hopefully it, it just continues to improve. But, um, uh, we've gone out of our way to make sure we are presenting animals to folks and sharing animals with folks in a in a light that helps them to understand uh, what they're up against. And that, that goes on behind the scenes with all the high-level husbandry that we do. We have three full-time veterinarians at the Cincinnati Zoo, two full-time vet techs, a full-time nutritionist, a full-time animal welfare manager. We have, you know, a team of uh, six professional, uh, 13 professional primate keepers alone. Uh, so a lot goes into that enrichment, which just means something different every day for them. You know, not only do we worry about their physical health, but their psychological health. And we have a comprehensive environmental enrichment program. We do operant conditioning with positive reinforcement, meaning we can train the gorillas to do very important husbandry behaviors. Each one of the gorillas or bonobos, orangutans, have about 30 different behaviors that they'll do on cue with us because we maintain a good relationship with them, but we also have that, um, we also have that um, ability to condition them through small positive approximations to get them to do some pretty complicated behaviors, not just body presentations, but even accept hand injection uh, if they need a shot voluntarily. We can do complex things like cardiac exams awake on a silverback. And, you know, silverbacks are tough guys. They have to be, mm -hmm. they have to protect their family group and they're hardwired that way. So you have to develop that trust and relationship with them. And then through that process of operant conditioning with positive reinforcement, we're able to shape him so he can present his chest and allow us to do a full awake cardiac workup on him. We're training for blood pressure and blood draw. So very important stuff that uh, goes into the quality of, of the whole product at, 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 that, the zoo, that zoos do. And then, of course, that's moved on forward to uh, conservation and conservation interpretation. Not only do we take care of the animals we have here at Cincinnati Zoo, we do that on a globe, on a national scale. We all the gorillas and all there's something like 300 different species survival plans. 
that oversee the management of any given species all throughout North America. We keep, I sit on the Gorilla Species Survival Plan Management Group as well as the Bonobo SSP Management Group. I also sit on something called the Prosimian Taxon Advisory Group uh, Steering Committee. And that includes all the little dudes, little primates like lemurs and and lorises and galegos and things you may not <laughs> you may not recognize right, right. here, you know. So and and so we get together on our, uh, we're in constant contact actually, coming up with uh, transfer plans or breeding plans that go into not only managing the health of the population. We don't take primates from the wild anymore. We don't want to take primates from the wild anymore. We do everything we can protect primates in the wild. So it's up to us to make sure we're doing everything perfectly with the ones we have in zoos. And a whole lot goes into that. We keep track of everybody's genetics. We keep track of everybody's personalities. Each zoo has a representative that communicates with the SSP. Um, and we get together regularly and come up with, with these master plans of how to uh, take care of these guys as a as a big population. So we're doing it at the zoo level. We're doing it at the national level. And then we, we go the next step and we do stuff in the field. And Cincinnati Zoo, as well as plenty of other zoos, have been part of, you know, wild, we've been part of wild gorilla conservation for uh, about 20 years now, over 20 mm -hmm. years, actually. Uh, most of that's been focused in the Republic of Congo, which uh, mm -hmm. has one of the very first, if not, it is the oldest running study of wild western lowland gorillas, which are the kind we have in zoos. There are two species of gorillas, and those species are broken into two subspecies. There are mountain gorillas, or there's eastern gorillas and western gorillas. Mm -hmm. Mountain gorillas are eastern gorillas. They're the ones that Diane Fossey worked with. Those are the more familiar ones. If you go see gorillas in the wild, most likely you're, you're going to go see a mountain gorilla because the ecotourism is set up there. The word ecotourism didn't exist before the mountain gorilla ecotourism program was started mm -hmm, and it's mm -hmm. wildly successful. When that started, gorillas were in about four mountain gorillas were down about 400 individuals and going the wrong direction rapidly. Mm -hmm. But after they started the, you know, combining the research with ecotourism, with community outreach and education and, and support of the community. So they had buy-in, now gorillas, uh, mountain gorillas are at a thousand individuals. That's still not a good number, but mm -hmm. based on how much space they have because they've lost all their rainforest other than a relatively small section, that's pretty darn good. And that is an, a direct, one of the biggest success stories in conservation going are the mountain gorillas. So zoos, we have western lowland gorillas. Right. And right. west, so, yeah. So Western lowland gorillas are more plentiful in the wild. They, they, they exist across a lot more countries in Central Africa. You find them in Gabon and Nigeria, Cameroon, Republic of Congo, not the Democratic Republic of Congo, but the Republic of Congo, uh, Central African Republic. And, um, and there are about estimated 300,000 or so of those. That number actually just has gone up, which is really good to know. Not that they've grown, but they're just really – they're a lot better now at taking censuses than they were before. The problem is they are still in, in bad shape uh, with the rate of deforestation going on throughout uh, the Central African countries, their range countries, um, which feeds into things like the bushmeat trade, which um, – just means, you know, they're, they're, for centuries, local people used to eat gorillas and other animals that feed their families. The problem is it's become a big commercial business. So, mm -hmm. uh, and it's illegal because gorillas are an endangered species and protected. And, and so these, these trappers will go in on logging roads because the, the, the rainforest has all these, all these deep logging roads cut back into and they illegally pull out bushmeat, gorillas, dikers, anything they can catch. And sell it. I mean, it is a huge, huge business, and it is contributing to the very rapid decline of western lowland gorillas and, and a lot of other species that share the rainforest habitat. So we lose an estimated 2,000 western lowland gorillas a year. It's kind of hard mm -hmm. to completely know, but, yeah. but it's, just not, it's just not sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. So it's important that we're kind of doing, doing the front work right now. And our partners, so it's a Wildlife Conservation Society uh, uh, project called the Nubali and Doke Project. It's located mm -hmm. in the Republic of Congo and the Nubali and Doke National Park. It's North Republic of Congo. 
and we've been uh, supporting their work for years um, in lots of ways. Primarily, we make sure we we send we, we support them financially, of course, but we also ask them specifically, what do you need help with all the time? I've had the opportunity to travel there on several occasions, uh, and a lot of times it's just to go out and do a site visit because if you're investing large amounts of money, you want to make sure it's being used properly, of course. But uh, also, we've done some fun things or interesting things like a community outreach project for all the local villages that exist around this place, and it is pretty remote. It's, it's got some of the most remote places anybody ever goes to. And uh, along with their education component, we developed uh, this multimedia mobile unit that could go around to these villages that have no electricity or anything and put together uh, an interpretive program, kind of designed on some of the stuff we do in zoos uh, with some activities and wearing gorilla shirts and uh, mm-hmm. some videos that were done in English and Lingala that so we could talk about the world view of gorillas and, and the researchers could come out and talk with the local villagers about what they're doing because sometimes they don't get out of you know the locals don't get out into the into the forest. Kind of like in cities we don't get out of the right, nature sometimes. Right. It's kinda of, it's kinda of the same thing. But we so we yeah. wanted to bring that to them and, and paint that picture and surveyed it and we had a paper published and you know it wasn't the biggest groundbreaking work but it's just we we look for niches where the cincinnati zoo can be effective and can help beyond just just um donating money uh we Mm -hmm. also uh had the i've had the opportunity to and we've helped support the habituation of of some of the study groups which is a slow slow process to get them used to researchers and trackers nearby and on one particular visit there i went to this place called mondika which is mm-hmm. a study site where they do do up close observations on specific family groups to get that that demographic information and behavior information and um and they used me as a the get a guinea pig to be the first <laughs> the first the first outside guy to go in to see oh how God, how how yeah how conditioned these and they trusted me to act properly because I know how to act around a gorilla mm-hmm. to make sure mm-hmm. I'm not off- offending the gorilla or right, right. reacting the wrong way. So they had some measure justification for it, and uh, mm-hmm. fortunately they they were well, there was one female. It was kind of funny. When we went out there, there was one particular female, and she was cough vocalizing or barking at me, which is mm-hmm. an aggressive vocalization warning you. I don't like you there, you know. So <laughs> I just kind of looked looked away and put my head down a little bit, and she went about her business. And then when we were back at the camp, the guy shows me this video from like the day before where she came rushing out of the <laughs> out of the out of the bushes, and he hid behind this skinny little six inch tree, and her <laughs> face was right. It's like oh, thanks, God. thanks, buddy. So yeah. I I, I passed the do it. yeah, but but I passed the gorilla test. You know, she warned <laughs> me. I listened. I looked away, and I understood what she was saying and reacted. So great stuff like that. You know. Most recently, yeah. you know, just just this past March, I had the opportunity to take Thane Maynard, our director, who has been incredibly supportive of the work I've I've kind of managed out there in Congo all these years, and want to give him an opportunity to go out there and see it for himself. And that's important because that creates even more buy-in from your institution, and, and that's what we had, we had oh, to look yeah. for ways. And um, we actually took a local newspaper, the Cincinnati Enquirer, videographer and reporter out there with us. And traipsed around and and on this trip we went to a place that I hadn't been before. It is like one of the most remote places uh, human beings go in the mm-hmm. in the world, and uh, mm-hmm. it's at this place called the um, it's called the Guologo Triangle Study, headed up by a really hardcore uh, researcher and conservationist, Dave Morgan. And just to get back into this place, it's like a it's uh, how many miles is it? 10, 10 mile hike one direction back into it and you know just on top of riding on boats and planes and mm-hmm. little pirogue canoes back through there and hiking it's pretty intense but uh it was it's it was amazing to get back there and see some chimpanzees and the hardcore work they're doing so why is this work and then we videotaped it all produced a an article that went national was actually picked up by USA Today in a video, and that's all flo- floating out there as well to to bring it full circle back to our guests and to tell them the work we're doing and show them the work we're doing. So that's that's very important. 
So this work's important, you know. It, it, we learn a lot about the gorillas at, at, at the Embelly Bay study. The Embelly Bay study is that particular research that's the longest running research being done of wild western lolo gorillas, where gorillas come out into these naturally open clearings called bays. So mm-hmm. they're swampy areas with aquatic vegetation that the gorillas like to feed on. A hydrocaris is a particular plant that grows in in these bays, and they come out and spend hours and feed on this. But it also creates these opportunities for uh, uh, interactions between social groups or, or silverbacks looking to acquire females for their group. And it gives you all this magnificent behavior research. And, and they're learned, they've they learned about interbirth intervals and, and all this uh, very important information that we in turn apply to how we take care of gorillas back at the zoo. So we know mm-hmm. that the first time, first time a Western lowland gorilla is supposed to have a baby is around the age of 10 we know it's usually about four four years between offspring. We know a silverback usually doesn't uh, acquire females till he's uh, approaching twenty or fifteen to twenty, and you know mm-hmm. just all this important stuff that that they've learned. And also, it, and there's like three hundred different gorillas there at different times that show up and study. So they've got a large group to 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 watch and 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 learn about. And this is important uh, that they establish. You know, how many gorillas are in this area? How much rainforest do, do, does like a single family group or a whole area of gorillas require to survive as the outside rainforest continues to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How, how important are these giant trees, the ecology of the rainforest? How important are these giant trees to the that, that particular biome? So researchers are doing this now as the world around is shrinking. So hopefully we can – we're not going to stop it from shrinking, but hopefully mm-hmm. we can stop it before it gets down to the last 400 western lowland okay. gorillas like it did the last 400 mountain gorillas. Before you have to think a thousand gorillas is fantastic. <laughs> we I know. know. I and, know. And, that's, yeah. and that's the critical – that's the real critical work that's going on there. And uh, we use it a lot to help us manage gorillas in zoos. I uh... – Seriously, I could just listen to you talk about this all day. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and I do I, talk all day, so that's you have to no, cut me off it's, sometimes, Chris. No, 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 no. I don't think our listeners understand how special that was. Like listening to you talk, it. Oh man, that was amazing. It, Ron. Like you know, first of all, you are one of the people on Earth. You know, part of the SSPs working on to save these animals in the wild. And gorillas are, are very charismatic, one of many, many people's favorites. So, wow, that was that was awesome. Um, I just want to ask another and quick that, question and let and, you go. And, that, and that's why, yeah, well, that's why I say that's why gorillas are so important to zoos and so important to, you know, uh, having them at the Cincinnati Zoo or whatever zoo they're in. Because they have that ability to connect with people like, you know, all animals do. People like snakes and they like birds, but there's something about a gorilla, even above chimpanzees or other animals that people just are in awe of and, and they're compelled mm-hmm. by they're, they're compelling and they, they, right. they make you pay attention and they make you want to learn more about them and they make you care. And that's right. why they're so critical to have it in zoos and for zoos to then do everything they can to help them at the zoo on a national level and certainly paying it forward to the, field work so it's just a flagship species for conservation absolutely absolutely and i think you know it's important to you know not just it it helps bring in visitors and and sell that conservation message but it also Mm -hmm. is important that you know i i think where my next question for you was going to be how you know having these animals under human care because if they do, you know, like you said, the mountain gorillas, if, if they do go extinct in the wild or if the lowland gets down to those desperate numbers, you know, having conservation centers, having zoos, understanding behavior, reproductive rates, all those things. I mean, mm-hmm. so what are you really learning from them under your care? And then you can turn around and, and you know, spread that not just conservation message, but you said money that you're doing, you're, you're funding projects there in Africa. How else is having these gorillas under human care, helping them in the wild. Yeah. Well, like I've already talked about a little bit, they, mm-hmm. they are ambassadors for wild gorillas. They, they create the interest that is so critical to 
catch people's attention and tell the story of their wild counterparts. That is the primary mission of a zoo gorilla or as any zoo animal. And also, of course, we do work on a lot of research projects in zoos um, for all kinds of different animals. Uh, gorillas, uh, we do a lot of research on, you know, uh, on testosterone levels in, in young males and what age uh, we know they go through testosterone poisoning like a young teenager when they hit about 10 years old and the testosterone spikes through the roof, right? And we know mm -hmm. that at that point, they're probably too big for their britches and won't be able to stay in their natal group. And then maybe they're not going to be really able to just transition to a, to a, um, to a social group. So we identify these boys young and try and get them together in bachelor groups in zoos. Once again, this is more like what we've learned from wild gorillas because wild gorillas will do this. They will form young males will form bachelor groups, but we've studied why that is, I think differently than what they can do in the wild through that test, through um, testosterone testing and, and understanding what the function is, which also helps support, you know, what they're doing in the wild and why the gorillas are doing that and why you need this much space to be able to accommodate bachelor groups or whatever in the wild. So it kind of goes hand in hand, I guess. Um, but we, we, we're learning a lot from them that we apply maybe a little more than they learn from our stuff that they apply to the wild. But like I said, the number one reason for gorillas at zoos is to, is it, is it, is, it, is ambassadors for wild gorillas, that connection right. that's so critical. Yeah. Right. And, you know, and before we, we started recording, I, I brought up Harapin, the Sumatran rhino that was born there at Cincinnati Zoo. Sure. You've, you've had a few born there. And that was. Well, that is a good example of. Yeah, that's a perfect example of zoo research going back to the wild. So that mm -hmm. does happen a lot with a lot of species. Gorillas may not be the best example, but Sumatran rhinos is probably the premier example of. A species that is in desperation. There's probably a hundred to, to fifty to a hundred left in the wild. Probably more like fifty right now. This was identified years ago that this is a species on the verge of extinction, a megafauna on the on the verge of extinction. And many many years ago, zoos got together and said, "We got to learn. We got to help this out. We have to learn all we can about these animals before they're just gone." So they brought in. A number of them to zoos, several zoos around the country, including the Cincinnati Zoo, got, got some Sumatran rhinos because, you know, we were such leaders in black rhino reproduction back then. And it just made sense that Cincinnati Zoo take that knowledge. But they were tricky. Sumatran rhinos were like no other rhino. And no one could figure them out for the longest time until we brought on a researcher who we put, you know, that the zoo put specifically in charge. This is your job. Figure this out. Dr. Terry Roth, who still heads our mm -hmm. Center for mm -hmm. Research, Center for Research of Endangered Wildlife. And she figured out things that no one else knew about Sumatran rhino. She knew she, they figured out how long their cycles were. She figured out exactly when the time that they might want that the, the female was ovulating. She also, or, or that the, the, it was coming up, she also discovered that they're induced ovulators and that it takes the, the breeding to actually stimulate this. But she could tell the keepers because Sumatran rhinos are very solitary. They don't live in, you know, pairs for the most part and usually only come together for breeding. But because she could tell when the hormones were at the right point through blood work and fecal samples, she could advise the staff on when was the best time to put the pair of rhinos together to have a successful breeding. And so, so much work and it goes far beyond that. I am far from the Sumatran rhino expert, right, right, but right. now that now Sumatran rhinos are pretty much done in zoos. There, there are no more Sumatran rhinos in zoos. It just wasn't a sustainable number in zoos to be able to do that long term. But we learned so much valuable information. We've sent two of our rhinos back to, um, back to Sumatra to be in sanctuaries. And a part of Terry's job all these years as well was to work with the sanctuaries in the field and help teach them how to do the same work, which is critical. If you're going to save Sumatran rhinos, you're going to have to have these sanctuaries in these places along with working with the government to try and conserve their habitat. So that information was invaluable to doing, to, to giving these guys a chance and uh, so that's a good example of where zoos have, have really contributed everything to the wild. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, 
so special having you. I mean, because that that captures what Angie and I have been doing for going on a year and a half now, talking about a lot of these endangered species and how zoos have been critical in saving so many species. California condor, Przewalski horse, Sumatran rhinos, black-footed ferret. I mean, we just... Absolutely. Every species we cover, you know, week after yep. week after week. Yep. What what you do is so critical to the animals in the wild. So I hope the listeners can understand that. Because I, I, I guess one of my questions was, you know, if you didn't have gorillas in zoos or you didn't have a lot of these species in zoos, I mean, just really quick, what what would the reality be? Well, I think there would just be a bigger disconnect between the people of influence. You know, the people in Africa, they're one thing. You know, everybody says, how could they do that to their gorillas? Well, you know, the number one, one of the number one uh, things that are is contributing to the, um, to the uh, bushmeat crisis is mineral mining. And so all this law, all the logs and all this minerals and everything that's coming out of there isn't going to Africa people. It's going to Westerners. It's going to the United States. It's going to Europe. It's going to China. And, and they're paying them pennies for it. So if you have to make sure people get that message, one of the things we've really excelled at here over the years is cell phone recycling. We started a cell phone recycling project at the Cincinnati Zoo. Gosh, it's well over 10 years now. And you may say, what's that got to do with anything? But there's a mineral in all of our cell phones and a lot of our electronics called coltan. And coltan is mined from Congo. And it's used in the manufacturing of our cell phones. So everybody's got a little bit of gorilla habitat in your pocket, most likely. And you Mm -hmm. don't even know it. So we tell that story here at the zoo through the gorillas. We offer people a chance to recycle their cell phones with us. We even have a partnership with Gorilla Glue, which is a local Cincinnati company. Mm-hmm. Where we'll do na- national projects where uh, the class or maybe scout group that collects the most cell phones uh, can win a, a prize, a cash prize. The, the group that comes up with the most clever um, collection campaign or video that goes along with it also uh, can win a prize and get their video out there. So that's important because you're reaching young people. And over that time, we've collected well over 100,000 cell phones which is by far the most any zoo has ever collected. And what's most important about that is, you know, we, the money we make off of it, sure, we, we reinvest right back into our, cell, our wild gorilla conservation work. So we're making money. That's one part of it off of the cell phones. But mostly, I like that 100,000 cell phones just isn't 100,000 cell phones. That's 100,000 thoughts people had about conserving gorillas while they're at home. <laughs> it's it's amazing, when they took yeah. that – they took that home with them, and, and they put these projects together, and they collect all these cell phones, and they're thinking about it, and they're talking about it, and they're young people, and they won't forget that as they grow up. And maybe they, it inspires them to be the next Diane Fossey, or maybe they work at Walmart. But I guarantee you they're going to remember. They're going to have a soft spot in their heart about how they helped gorillas. When they come to the zoo, they're going to see gorillas and maintain that, that care, and that's, that's what it's all about. Trying to no, yeah, that's yeah, bravo on you guys. I mean, yeah, that's I know we've we've mentioned that before, but we will definitely keep highlighting that to uh recycle these things and yeah, you know, participate sure. in those programs. So, here, here's a random question I was just while you were talking, and I know you you work with all sorts of primates. Can you just kind of talk the difference between you know working with gorillas versus say orangutans? Yeah, well, I always say we have three great ape species at Cincinnati Zoo. We have we have gorillas, we have bonobos, which are super rare as well. Only place you find bonobos are in the Democratic Republic of Congo. They're our closest living relatives. Most ape species share like ninety eight percent of the same DNA as humans. Bonobos share ninety nine point nothing percent same mm-hmm. DNA as as we do, and then orangutans. So orangutans are quite a bit different than gorillas. There's the are similar in many ways, but but different. I'll say gorillas are from Mars, orang or bonobos are from Venus, and orangs are from from some planet we haven't discovered yet. They are <laughs> just they're so fun and so unusual, and that's because gorillas and chimps and bonobos live in social family groups. They have social learning all their lives. So when they're growing up, in the day a gorilla is born, they don't or ape is born, orang 
bonobo. Most primates, they don't know much at all. They don't, they're like a, you know, when a spider or a snake hatches, they pretty much are hardwired and are ready to go day one. No one has to teach them what they need to do. But gorillas are like humans, orangs, like humans. They have to learn everything uh, as they grow up, life lessons and all this stuff. And, and so gorillas and chimps and bonobos, they don't have to learn every little thing before they become an adult because they live in family groups and they can learn from each other throughout their whole lives. So there's all this social learning always going on, just like humans. Orangs live solitary lives in the wild. They don't live in large social groups. That's because of the environment. They come from very swampy areas. They cannot you know, sustain big family groups. There's not enough food to go around. It's just not workable. So male and females only come together for the most part for breeding. And, uh, and, and that's only after a, an incredibly long interbirth interval. Next to humans, it's the longest interbirth interval of any animal on the planet. It takes a female orang about eight to ten years to raise her offspring. So she mm-hmm. won't be willing to reproduce again for that long, which is also a big concerning part about their, you know, critically endangered status and the palm oil issues that, 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 mm-hmm. that threaten and deforestation because orangs have even a harder time than a gorilla or a chimp to repopulate because of those long interbirth intervals. So that, 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 that's a species that just can't catch up overnight, even if mm-hmm. the deforestation stops. So that's a big challenge. But because they take so long to, you know, they live these solitary lives and once they leave mom and eight years old or whatever, they still haven't come across every single thing they might. So orangs have these this insanely high curiosity level. Like I think more than human beings even. I think if it could I don't and no one's actually measured it, but I think if you could measure what the curiosity level there was, orangs have it more than any species because they have to figure stuff out for themselves or because they don't have anybody else to show them or talk through it or work through it. And uh, so they never get tired of trying to figure something out. It's, it's, it's insane. So we say there's an old joke. And if you throw a screwdriver in with a group of gorillas, they're going to run from it because gorillas yeah. really don't want any trouble for the most part, as big as they are. They're like, eh, I don't want, I don't want to deal with that. If you throw it in with a group of chimps, they'll start stabbing each other with it because chimps are, <laughs> are you know, chimps are dead on. We're the same as chimps. There's no difference between humans and chimps. They're zero. You know, they love their families. They take care of their babies. They also organize hunting parties and kill animals and eat them. And they wage wars on other chimp tribes and murder other chimps. So zero difference between us and chimps. And if you throw a screwdriver in with an orangutan, they'll figure out how to take their, their bedroom uh, facility apart and, and be out in like two minutes. So you, you never give an orang a screwdriver. He'll, he'll MacGyver his way right out of there real quick. So orangs are something else. So I don't know if that, that answers your oh. question or not. But No, it does. They, you know, it's – I forgot what it might have been. San Diego Zoo. There was there was an orang that kept getting out, and then would walk the zoo at night, and then <laughs> would would go back in before anybody else showed back up, and did it for months you, until they yeah. finally figured it out. <laughs> That's it, an orang, man. I tell you, I heard it one story one time, and there's not a lot of orang. We were pretty good at keeping animals in, but there was one story mm-hmm. I heard, and I won't name the institution where this orang got out. And uh, proceeded when no one was around. Proceeded to walk to the laundry room, which he had a sight line from his bedroom, mm-hmm. and proceeded to dump a whole box of uh, soap powders in the in the washing machine and started doing laundry because she had seen people doing that for so long. She thought this is what you do when you get out and you walk over to that room. Started doing a load of laundry. So, oh my God. so that's why it's important. We. Yeah. That's why they're, I mean, they're super smart, and we care deeply mm-hmm. about that and are acutely aware of how intelligent they are and really work ourselves uh, hard to make sure we're doing everything for them. Here at Cincinnati, we just mm-hmm. expanded our mm-hmm. – more than doubled the size of our gorilla facility. It's a spectacular, right. dynamic place, and the gorillas have lots of options and choice, and you know we work hard at that. But yeah, right, orangs, right. they are, they are <laughs> something special, that's for sure. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, so you've been to Africa quite a bit, and I'm really glad you brought up the ecotourism part. Can you talk about the process of, just say somebody like me, I'm not a gorilla expert, I want to go to Africa, I want to see these mountain gorillas in the wild, how do I do that? Is there 
any training involved and how do they prepare you to be, you know, a foot away from a gorilla? <laughs> so you, anybody wants to go see a gorilla, you have to realize only about 50% of the tourists ever come back alive. That's the first. No, I'm just, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, and that's what some people think, you know, and that's, that mm-hmm. couldn't be furthest the furthest from the truth, especially when it comes to mountain gorillas. So, you know, they say mountain gorillas, if you look at any of these, you know, websites or whatever about the top 10 things you're supposed to do before you die. And that's not just mm-hmm. animal things. Going to see the Grand Canyon, doing this, doing that. Seeing mountain gorillas in the wild is a, I don't know how to describe it. It will change who you are when you get the chance to do it. So, number one, you have, everybody must go see mountain gorillas. And everybody can. And that's what the that's the beauty of the mountain girls. Like I said, that was a place that coined the phrase eager tourism, that -hmm. project. It didn't exist before then. And they've been doing this for well over 40 years now. So Rwanda is so well set up to support Western tourists because it is their number one source of income. They've turned the mountain gorillas into a deficit from a deficit. Like they were about ready to take their last little bit of rainforest for cattle grazing back when mm-hmm. Diane Fossey was even still there. And uh, and they turned it into this other industry. But they're super sensitive about the quality of care that they do. So what you do is, you know, you just don't – you should just research it a little bit. There's plenty of tour companies that will more than adequately facilitate your trip to go see mountain gorillas. The airport's very easy to go through, uh, very nice accommodations to stay in, both – in, in the capital city there in Rwanda and also at the uh, at the Mountain Gorilla area, just any any category you want. It's not going to be cheap. I have to just say that just mm-hmm. because you're flying flying to Rwanda and you know a lot of travel and you hire a tour guy to take you up there. And um, so they have ten habituated family groups of gorillas at uh, at uh, in Rwanda and. They can take 10 individual people per day to go see these gorillas. So that, that's kind of the, that's the cutoff and that's the limit to make sure you're not. And you get one hour of time once you find the gorillas. So that, that's kind of how it's set up and that's how they facilitate it. It's not inexpensive. And I think it's probably about up to about a thousand bucks per visit now per person mm-hmm. just to, just so people know that. But once again, it will change your life. So what happens is you, you, you go to your hotel that's right outside of the, the park. You go to the park headquarters. You get assigned a group. There are two rangers assigned to your t- group of 10 people to go see your group of gorillas. They kind of size you up. And if they think a gorilla family has bedded down closer to the camp, they'll try and put the people who might be a little more physically challenged there if you want a robust, you know, <laughs> hike up and down muddy mountains, they can facilitate that too to where you get to it. So if you really, I mean, a lot of people love that, you know, a real adventure, mm-hmm. and you get way out in there. So they'll, do the, and then they instruct you on how to behave and their rules, and you don't try and touch the gorillas, and and you're supposed to keep a certain distance back. And they do a, and they talk to you about how to behave if a gorilla should happen to come running by when we were at the mount, mountain gorillas that we had one silverback that, and, and they kind of looked back at us and said, everybody get down. They tell you to kind of squat down and look small. If one gets too by and a big silverback came running through the forest right behind us, it was just awe inspiring, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but nobody ever gets hurt. Seriously. When I said only half the people return, they, they said <laughs> yeah, nothing, no. No, nothing further from the truth. Nobody ever gets hurt. As long as you're be, not doing something stupid, you'll be fine. If you go up and try and stand nose to nose to a silverback, you will lose oh. that staring yes. contest right now. You, you have no chance. <laughs> but uh, no, you, so yeah. anyway, they have it really. So and they can even accommodate elderly folks. They can accommodate people who, you know, have trouble walking. They, they, they'll, they'll they have porters that help you will be your shadow and kind of help you up through hard places if you would like to have a porter and they're all very polite and very professional. They have, they can actually put you on, on a, I don't like the word stretcher. I don't know what else to call it, but they can put you on a, on a stretcher and carry you into the forest to go see gorillas. If you physically can't walk there. So they've really made it 
like a wonderful experience and a life changing experience for anybody who wants to go. And I, that's where I highly recommend people go. Now, where I go to Congo to see the Western Lowland Girls, that's a real Tarzan adventure. That is walking through water up to your hips. That is long, draining, excruciatingly hard hikes through the forest. A lot of bugs and a lot of – watch that video we put out uh, recently and, and, you, and you'll know what we're talking about. And uh, yeah. so I wouldn't yeah. – but there is, there is some I – shouldn't, I shouldn't like poo-poo that away though because there is some really good ecotourism in uh, building in Congo as well to see gorillas. And that's one of the things we've helped uh, – one of the many things we've helped them with over the years is helped with some of the infrastructure and uh, health care for their trackers and for their – for the ecotourism part that goes on at, at, and then the Bali and Doke project, because we know yeah. um, that kind of uh, capacity building for the, for the people working there, as well as the ecotourism facilitation is important. So they can have that more revenue to generate for the research and conservation work they do. So that's very important part of the big conservation picture, you know, research, right. Right. Prote- protection, ecotourism, it all goes hand in hand to the most successful conservation projects out there. Whatever right, right. And, I, and just for, you know, if the listeners missed it in the beginning, you talked about how they were down to 400 and because of ecotourism, now they're up to a thousand. So your money goes directly to preserving mountain gorillas, period. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> 100%. And the health of the of the people around the community, you know, they're they're get they're 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 you know they're not being, I don't know, ripped off for their resources. There, they are benefiting from it in a healthy, productive way. Education, and unlike some parts of Africa, which once again, unfortunately, are being taken advantage of by Western big business, by Asian big business, and just getting their resources stolen from them. At, for pennies, which are so valuable yeah. to the to, to the world, and they they should be some of the richest, most you know comfortable, happy people. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. a lot of it is is pretty. There's a lot of human tragedy associated with these with these issues as well. So right. anyway, hopefully right. they hopefully yeah. they figure it out like they did in Rwanda. You know. Yeah, yeah. I know it's picking up steam. I know it's picking up steam. Yeah. So you know, working with gorillas as long as you have, do you have any funny gorilla stories? Oh, well, let's let me think of a funny gorilla story. Yeah. I I don't I you know, I I have rewarding gorilla stories, I think, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. I, I and, and and I'll probably come up with a funny one here soon, but you know, t- mm-hmm. today actually that they were recording this, I'm sure it's not the day that it'll air, mm-hmm. is a, a gorilla named Gladys's uh sixth birthday. And Gladys mm-hmm. was an orphan gorilla. Who came to us uh, from a different zoo as part of the species survival plan management? They recommended we take Gladys uh, to be part to find her a foster mother here at the Cincinnati mm-hmm. Zoo. Since we've had fifty gorillas born at the Cincinnati Zoo over the years, we're one of the top mm-hmm. zoos in the world to, for gorilla reproduction. And you know, Gladys came in and uh, stole everybody's heart. We put together a twenty-four hour, seven day a week. Uh, um, surrogate gorilla team for Gladys because you know the day a gorilla is born mom never puts them down and that's what they need when their mother isn't taking care of them that happens every once in a while so uh so we but we also knew we had to make sure we started treating Gladys like a mother gorilla would so uh we would hold her like a gorilla not like a human baby but kind of more like a gorilla we would make gorilla vocalizations to her which Mm -hmm. is kind of funny we would talk to her like a gorilla so if you know when she's real little, it's all soothing, belch, vote, mm, 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 positive vocalizations yeah. like that. And then that sounds kind of scary to us, but to a gorilla, that's really good sound. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, and as she got bigger, you know, sometimes she would test you and give you a little bite. So we would kind of cough, vocalize at her, <laughs> and, and kind of let her know that's not right, or hold her down. We had taught her, We wore these furry vests that uh, we got from a local uh, faux furrier that that looked Mm -hmm. like gorilla hair and the keepers would have to dress like gorillas as well. And to teach her how to climb up and ride on her backs and all this preparation in her first few months to eventually join a foster mom, 
that was watching us do all this next door. I don't know why she must have thought of the keepers doing all this crazy stuff, but you know, <laughs> she was she was getting to know the baby as we mm. were teaching her all this stuff until the kid was strong enough and big enough uh, that we felt okay. It's time for the foster mom, Malinzi is her name, mm. to take over Gladys's care. So she came to us at one month old, and by four and a half months old, we had her fully living with a mom and. Now she's six years old today mm-hmm. uh, oh, as we're wow. recording yeah. this and, and, and totally independent and learning all those life lessons. Gorillas need to learn to properly function in gorilla society. And uh, it's, it's, you know, rewarding things like that that, that make it all s- special. That's for sure. Oh, I can only imagine. I can just, oh, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Those are, those are the days that like, you know, that's, those are the stories that keep you going, right? That keep you motivated to do what you do. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, we're just, we're fortunate to be part of their world. My team is a top notch group of keepers and, uh, you know, our philosophy around here is we asked to be here. Not one gorilla did. So we happily do whatever we need to do and, uh, and put off our own personal stuff and life for these guys, not because we have to, but because they make you want to. You have no choice where <laughs> they, mm-hmm, they compel mm-hmm. you to want to want to do this. And uh, right. so it's just it's very rewarding all the time. But when you get a chance to be part of so many different special things over the years, um, it, 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 it makes it. Yeah, you're right. It makes it that much better. Right. All right. So this is always my toughest question at the end. And it's it's one I like to ask all of my guests. And that is, you know, how do we convince others? I guess I'll, I'll do the two part and let you tackle it. How do we convince the public, the governments, you know, people around the world that fighting for endangered species is worthwhile and worth the money and the time and effort? And the second part is, do you believe we have a moral obligation to fight and save endangered species? Yeah, well, like I said, we've kind of covered, you know, how do we do that? You know, mm-hmm. we we share that story and we invite them out and we show them how the uh, the amazing animals here at the zoo and, and try and connect with people that way. Um, you know, as far as is is why I mean gorilla specifically, it, it always seems kind of funny. And I think it's why anybody would not want to save a gorilla in the wild because. It's it's the same as saving ourselves in Cincinnati or Florida, where you're at, wherever you're at, because gorillas have a direct connection to the rainforest, right? They're gardeners of the rainforest. They eat the rainforest. They they keep it healthy and regenerating. They spread seeds in their dung. They keep the rainforest thriving and healthy. So why is that important to us? Well, rainforests are the water reservoirs of the planet. They're great big sponges that keep our water where it needs to be and slowly releases it around the planet to water crops in the United States or Europe or wherever it might be. They're also the, I like to eat. I don't know about you. I like having food yes. grow, <laughs> c- crops grow. So, <laughs> so that's important. They're the lungs of the planet. They create a disproportionate amount of the oxygen on the planet. So uh, I like to breathe too. That's a thing we like to do in Cincinnati. Yes. I, I, I like I like oxygen. That's kind of important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you know, if you, if even if you don't care about a gorilla or a chimp or a pato or a yellowback diker or a red river hog or a colobus monkey or whatever lives in the rainforest, you should care about the health of the rainforest because it more than directly affects your life your daily life and the direction this planet's going and the future of your kids if you care about your family. So there's very selfish reasons to care about gorillas and to care about the rainforest. If Even if you don't care about them personally, you should care about them for yourself. So that's the part that I always have it, it kind of scratch my head at uh, why people don't put all that together completely. I think there's a lot of good people that do, and that's the good news, you know. Right now, we hear a lot of crazy stuff in in the news, but you know, I do know that there are a lot of people who who do care and and are spreading that word, like the Cincinnati Zoo. And uh, you know, I gotta think people are smart enough to figure this this thing out once 
we can get past all the silliness that's getting in the way. We we right. have we have the te- we have the technology to do it. We have the ability to power massive areas with solar panels. We can do this stuff. It's just around the corner. Hopefully we can do it before we get too f- much further along and we have to lose Sumatran rhinos or we have to lose orangutans. How far that goes and what it's like 10 years from now, I can't tell you. It, 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 it looks kind of rough sometimes, but, you know, there's always time to do something. So that's the good news. It's not yeah. gloom and doom completely, but we definitely have to get our heads on straight and the smart folks and have to kind of <laughs> help people who might be challenged a, li- a little bit more to come along. From those selfish reasons, if if it has to be, you know, no, I, that's, maybe that's uh, that what needs to be promoted a little bit more. So yeah, yeah and what would, I, that's, if that that's makes sense? Time, yeah, it does. It absolutely does, and I think that uh, that captures it in in a totally new light that somebody hasn't brought up before. I think that's awesome. That is awesome. All right, so I guess my final question, because you got to go take care of some animals. <laughs> is, <laughs> How can our listeners help you and how can we support you and your efforts there at the Cincinnati Zoo? Well, Cincinnati Zoo specifically, we'll always tell you, come to the Cincinnati Zoo. You know, if you're if you're um, in town, anywhere around, you want to do a fun time in Cincinnati. Cincinnati is a great city. A lot of great heritage here. Lots of beer in Cincinnati. So <laughs> you come here, you know, we're an old German town in Cincinnati. And uh, the beer flows, and we have one of the best zoos in the country in little bitty Cincinnati, Ohio, you know. Some might think that this zoo shouldn't belong here. It should be in a big city with lots of money, and we just know how to do it uh, in a different way here at the Cincinnati Zoo. So you won't be disappointed. That's 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 one thing. So that's the best way you can help us out. But, you know, we got that great cell phone recycling program. Look for that. You can go to our website and, and see how maybe your school or something can join up with that program that would be wonderful and that Mm -hmm. goes directly back into helping gorillas and bonobos and a whole lot of other species that live in the central african rainforest um so uh and yeah just uh and be interested in your local zoo too you don't have to come all the way to cincinnati because we're all in it together you know aza institutions and take your kids out to camp like my parents did when they're little you know let them fall out of the camper onto the ground in the middle of the night. No one knows it like it's happened in my family before <laughs> when we were kids. It's all right. Let yeah. them get muddy. Let them go play in the rain and, mm-hmm. and let them build clubhouses and, and, and help them to want to do that. And that's critical. You know, that's the way you can help Cincinnati zoo out in our mission is, is go outside and with your kids when they're little before, you know, all you know is nothing wrong with, all the technology today. I enjoy it myself, but I was fortunate to be around before it existed. So I can Mm -hmm. only imagine how tough it is to, to get your kids out into the, into the woods, but do that, that, that would help Cincinnati out a whole, since I zoo out a whole lot as well. And then they want to come to the zoo and you won't have to make them because they like, no, I know. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to the zoo again today, kids. (laughs) (laughs) No, like I want to play. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So make them want to do it young. That's how you help out yeah. zoos and yeah. nature. And that probably yeah. is the most important thing somebody can do for your God, kid. I, I can't believe turn, it. We turn, them into, to... okay. turn them into beekeepers. Hey, how do you, yeah. I, I know something about you guys too. <laughs> yes, turn know, them into I beekeepers, know. Chris, when they're kids. Have, we have. We have. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <They>, uh... <laughs> I mean, I can't believe it's been an hour. Like, I could listen to you for another hour. Let, let, let's keep going. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'll talk, and that's my problem. People just have to cut me off every once in a while. No, no. Ron Ron Evans, Cincinnati Zoo, curator of primates. I think I'm going to have to have you on again. Like, we're going to have to do this again. It was amazing. Yeah. Next time oh. we can talk about I.I. I, or maybe yeah. Pygmy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pygmy, Pygmy, Pygmy Slow Loris. Other cool yes. subjects out there as yeah, well. Definitely. Although I am known for gorillas, and and they are my inspiration, and they're they're they're, they're, they're what drive me. But um, a lot bigger, bigger primate world than certainly just the gorillas. So, so right, there it is, it is, it is. But Ron, thank you so much for your time. I know you're busy. Uh, your message is going to get out. I, mean, I uh, oh, that's a, it's amazing hour. Thank you again so much. 
Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity and love what you're doing. Keep it up, and uh, I'll help you out anytime you need me. All right. Take care.